For the final, I have decided to examine arsenic's murderous history. I chose this topic because whenever I think of toxicology, I automatically think about forensic toxicology. I guess this is a result of all the police procedural shows and cop movies that I've seen. I've been conditioned to associate toxicology with murder and poison, and when I do, the first poison that comes to mind is arsenic. Despite this, I know very little about arsenic poisoning, so this seemed like the perfect opportunity to learn about it. I selected this topic before the module that mentioned arsenic, but I do not intend on focusing on arsenic's properties and damage it causes. Instead, I will examine arsenic's role as a murder weapon throughout history and how detection methods have evolved. Before I go into that, here is some simple background on arsenic. Arsenic is a metalloid that can combine with organic and inorganic substances and can prove harmful to most biological systems. Inorganic arsenic is much more dangerous and toxic than the organic variation, which is usually only poisonous in high concentrations. Arsenic can be found in low levels of nature, like in soil, copper, and lead ore deposits, and water. It can also be found in insecticides, weed killers, some Chinese herbal medicines, both as an intended ingredient and a contaminant, wood preservatives, ceramic enamels, paint, tobacco, and coal power plants. Arsenic has also been reported in food like milk and dairy products, beef, pork, poultry, cereal, and rice. The most common form of exposure comes from industrial exposure through work in metal foundries, mining, glass production, and the semiconductor industry, to name a few. Some symptoms with arsenic exposure include vomiting, abdominal pain, diarrhea, dark urine, termed black water urine, dehydration, cardiac problems, hemolysis, the destruction of red blood cells, vertigo, delirium, shock, skin changes, including darkening or discoloration, redness, swelling, and hyperkeratosis, mise lines in the fingernails, sensory and motor nerve defects, kidney and liver damage, and the development of certain cancers. Since many of these symptoms can be attributed to other diseases and illnesses, it can sometimes be difficult to properly diagnose arsenic exposure. That is why getting a comprehensive patient history is so important. It is important to follow thorough work history and history of dietary and nutritional habits, such as the use of nutritional supplements and iuyeritic medicines and alcohol abuse, and hobbies because compiling a patient history allows information to come to light that may make a diagnosis easier and quicker. This history may also reveal if there are any more potential victims. Since arsenic exposure is most often the result of some industrial accident, the history can reveal other people that may have been affected. Although the symptoms may point to other ailments, there are some telling signs. For instance, exposure often results in a patient's breath and urine smelling like garlic. This is often a key sign in a diagnosis. However, a variety of tests can be conducted which are helpful as well. Most doctors that suspect arsenic or other metal or metalloid poisonings will request lab studies such as blood cell counts and serum electrolytes such as calcium and magnesium. There is evidence of hemolysis, a type and screening for a potential blood transfusion is done. A result of less than 50 micrograms per liter is considered elevated, but acute toxic exposure may result in levels 5 to 100 times or more than those which are considered elevated. Urinalysis may also be used to detect elevated levels of arsenic. A urine spot test for arsenic and 24-hour urine collection can be conducted. However, a patient must not have consumed seafood for at least three days prior to urine collection, and the laboratory must speciate the arsenic into organic and inorganic types, because the inorganic form is responsible for symptoms and signs of arsenic toxicity. A urine pregnancy test can also be helpful. Additional electrocardiograms, ECGs, and EKGs, and nerve conduction tests are often done in any type of suspected arsenic exposure. Further tests include hematology, which examines the components of blood, including red and white blood cells and platelets, and then arterial blood gas, ABG tests, which measures the acidity and levels of oxygen and carbon dioxide in the blood from an artery. Plasma arsenic concentrations are also conducted but usually the results are not helpful until a diagnosis decision has already been made. Other helpful diagnostic studies include an abdominal x-ray, which may reveal areas that an x-ray is incapable of penetrating. 
nerve conduction studies, which may confirm peripheral neuropathy, and electrocardiography, which may reveal heart arrhythmias or failure induced from arsenic toxicity. While there are a slew of tests available to help diagnosing arsenic toxicity, that was not always the case. Heck, until recently, doctors didn't even have a clue on how to treat arsenic exposure. Before the 20th century, doctors had no idea how to treat arsenic poisoning, so they tried just about everything. Mostly, they would feed patients milk, vinegar, linseed, sugar, water, egg whites, you anything to induce vomiting. They also used the classic go-to, bleeding or bloodletting. Bloodletting involves withdrawing blood from a patient whether through incision or with leeches, in order to cure or prevent illness or disease. This is an archaic treatment that was based on the concept that blood, one of the four humors, the others being black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm, had to remain in perfect balance in order to maintain health. It was thought that an imbalance among these humors would lead to illness. A famous doctor of the time recommended putting 12 to 15 leeches on the belly at the place where the patient said the pain was worse. If the pain moved to a new spot, the leeches should then be ripped off and then placed in the new area. If this was the mindset regarding treatment, it should come as no surprise that up until recently, there was no reliable way to determine if someone had even been poisoned by arsenic. Arsenic toxicity eluded detection for so long, which is what made it a favored weapon throughout history. But once scientists were able to create an effective means of detection, a new era of forensic toxicology was ushered in. The work of Matthew Orfila was quite essential in this regard. In 1814, a time of groundbreaking discovery, Spanish chemist Orfila, who was working in France, published a treaty on poison and their detection. Orfila's work was groundbreaking because it was the first of its kind. Orfila suspected that metallic poisonings like arsenic might be the easiest to detect in the, in the body's tissue and pushed his research in that direction. Since Ophelia set the stage for what was to come, he is considered the father of toxicology. The next major breakthrough would come in 1836 when James Marsh, an obscure British chemist, created the first reliable chemical test for detecting the presence of arsenic in human tissue. Prior to the creation of the Marsh test, the available tests were not very strong, but they would contribute to Marsh's breakthrough. The first breakthrough in arsenic detection came in 1775 when Swedish chemist Carl Wilhelm Schiele discovered that by treating arsenic tri trioxide with nitric acid and combining it with zinc, it would transform into garlic-smelling arsene gas. Then in 1787, German physician Johann Metzger discovered that if arsenic trioxide was heated in the presence of carbon, the arsenic would sublime. In 1806, pharmacologist Valentin Rose took the stomach of a victim suspected of being poisoned and treated it with potassium carbonate, calcium oxide, and nitric acid so that any arsenic present would appear as arsenic trioxide and then could be subject to Metzger's test. Samuel Hannerman developed a test that would combine a sample fluid with hydrogen sulfide in the presence of hydrochloric acid. If arsenic was present, a yellow precipitate arsenic tri trisulfide would form. Although these tests were flawed because they were not sensitive enough, they would lay the ground work for Marsh to later build on. In 1832, John Bodo was on trial for poisoning his grandfather by lacing his coffee with arsenic. Marsh was called by the prosecution to try and detect the presence of arsenic. He tried the standard tests, but they did not work properly. When he passed the hydrogen sulfide through the suspicious fluids, the yellow precipitate that emerged deteriorated before it could be presented to the jury. Thus, the jury was not convinced of his guilt and Bodo walked. This infuriated Marsh, especially since Bodo would later confess to the murders. So Marsh became dedicated to devising a better test. Marsh used Skeely's work as a basis and built a glass contraption capable of detecting minute traces of arsenic and measuring its quantity. All one had to do was add a sample of tissue or bodily fluid to a glass vessel with zinc and acid. In the presence of arsenic, a scene gas would be produced. In addition to the hydrogen that would be produced regardless by the zinc reacting with the acid. Then by igniting the mixture, any arsene present would oxidize into arsenic and water vapor. 
This process would stain a cold ceramic bowl held in the flame with a silvery black arsenic deposit. This reaction is similar to that of Metzger's. Then by examining the intensity of the stain and comparing it to films produced using known amounts of arsenic, the particular amount of arsenic pre present could be determined. This test could detect minute traces as little as 0.02 milligrams, which was a huge benefit. Yet another one is the test was specific to arsenic. Although antimony could give off a false positive by forming stibbing gas, which can form a similar black deposit. The main difference is that it would not dissolve in sodium hydrochloride, but arsenic would. The next major breakthrough would come in 1840 during the trial of Marie Lafarge in Toulay, France. Orphelia successfully used Marsh's test to identify arsenic extracted from human tissue and presented his findings in court, thus becoming the first courtroom toxicological testimony. Marie Lafarge was on trial for poisoning her husband, Charles Lafarge, with arsenic. The circumstantial evidence in the case was quite convincing. Marie went to a local chemist and purchased arsenic trioxide, for which she claimed she intended to use to kill rats in her home. Additionally, the couple's maid testified that she saw Marie mix white powder into Charles' drink. The food in question was found to be positive for arsenic using the Marsh test as well as the traditional test. But when Charles's body was exhumed and treated, the chemist assigned to the case could find no traces of arsenic. Ophelia was brought in and he found that the Marsh test was not at fault, but rather those who conducted the test. Ophelia performed the test again, and this time he proved the presence of arsenic in Lafarge's body. Thus, Marie was found guilty and sentenced to life imprisonment with hard labor and became the first person to be convicted largely due to evidence found through forensic toxicology. The next advancement would come in 1842 when Hugo Reinch developed the Reinch test. The process involves planting arsenic onto copper wire. A sample of tissue or bodily fluid is dissolved in hydrochloric acid and a copper strip is inserted into the solution. The color of the copper coating is then examined and used to determine the presence of certain heavy metals. This advancement would then be followed by Max Gutzheit's semi-quantitative test in 1879. This test involved the pre precipitation of arsenic and will stick around for the next 100 years. Another breakthrough would come in the 1950s when Alan Walsh developed atomic absorption spectrometry. Within a decade, this technique would be used to detect a plethora of elements, including arsenic. The final breakthrough would come in the mid-1980s when inductively coupled plasma mass spectrometry, ICPMS, was made routinely available. ICPMS is a method recognized as the current standard in arsenic testing. For centuries, there was no scientific method for detecting arsenic, but in recent years, we have made great strides forward. For nearly 140 years, arsenic analysis was based on precipitation or plating techniques, but advancements led to a shift that saw the next 40 years rely on instrumental techniques. This provided better selectivity and sensitivity. By examining how toxicology testing evolved over the years, one can see that early tests focused on qualitative over quantitative. This makes sense since quantitative methods would only become possible once techniques and instrumental methods improved and this would not truly come until the 1950s. It was at this time that quantitative tests became practical and easily available for forensic, for forensic toxicologists. Today, because of the con contributions made by these various scientists, we are no longer stuck with the comical tests of the past. Before the Marsh test came to fruition, the most common method of testing for arsenic involved throwing a sample of the victim's stomach contents into a fireplace. If the burning sample gave off a garlic odor, then it was believed to contain arsenic. But this archaic test was based on the assumption that the doctor did indeed have a sample, which would have been pretty rare. Autopsies were extremely rare in the early 19th century because it was considered irreligious to interfere with a dead body. This was so against the norm that medical schools had to resort to buying corpses for dissection through grave robbers. Since obtaining a sample through an autopsy was out of the question, a doctor would have to resort to collecting scrapings from the patient's dried vomit, a task most viewed to be outside of their job description. Over time, however, autopsies would lose their stigma and become more common. 
thus collecting samples would become much easier as well. However, although doctors could now get samples, there still remained the issue of not having a dependable method for analyzing the sample. The only available test was the garlic smell test, but as we have already looked at, things would not remain like that for long. We have already covered how arsenic diagnosis and, and detection has evolved over the years. Now let's look at how arsenic has been used as a murder weapon over the years. Arsenic has a long history that stretched back thousands of years. Arsenic goes back all the way to the 4th century where mineral forms of arsenic were known. However, it would not be until 1250 that German scholar Albertus Magnus would first isolate the element, thus gaining the credit for arsenic's discovery. While Magnus was the first to isolate arsenic, the first precise directions for the preparation of metallic arsenic would be written by our old friend Paracelsus, the physician alchemist who was considered the father of modern toxicology and who coined the, the key toxicological phrase, the dose makes the poison. Although arsenic's official discovery was in 1250, people have been aware of arsenic for a long time and this awareness includes its harmful and lethal nature. All the way back in 1st century Rome, Greek physician Dioscorides, a member of Emperor Nero's court, described arsenic as a poison, thus proving people had known of its deadly potential for ages. Hence why it has such an infamous history as a poison of choice for dastardly murderers. Arsenic was a favorite poison because it was essentially the perfect murder weapon. It was easy to obtain and nearly undetectable. Arsenic lacks color, odor, and taste when mixed in food or drink and it was so prevalent that it was easily accessible to all classes of society. Arsenic was also hard to detect post-mortem because, as we discussed, the methods of detection were non-existent and all the symptoms resembled other common ailments such as cholera and even food poisoning. Over time, white arsenic or arsenic trioxide emerged as the arsenic of choice and a fatal amount was about the size of a pea. The small amount required to kill a target only added to our arsenic's benefit. Arsenic had so many benefits that it became the go-to method of murder for, for politicians and other people of power. Arsenic poisoning was so common and used so frequently in politics that whenever a person of prominence, like a princess, king, or cardinal, died, it was automatically assumed that they had been murdered by arsenic. Arsenic in politics goes as far back as Rome in the 4th century BC. Arsenic poisoning would go on to become so prevalent that in 82 BC, Roman dictator Lucius Cornelius Sulla had to step in and try to prevent what was becoming a poisoning epidemic. He issued the Lex Cornelia, the first known law against poisoning. Arsenic and poison in politics can also be seen in Italy during the early Renaissance. Records of the city councils of Florence from the time reveal just how widespread arsenic's use was. The records contain detailed testimony naming victims, prices, and contracts as well as transaction and payment dates. The most notable uses of arsenic during the time were the Borgias. The Borgias were an Italo-Spanish noble family who rose to prominence during the Italian Renaissance. During the 15th and 16th centuries, they rose to prominence in political and religious affairs. They even produced two popes, one of which was Pope Alexander VI. It was during Alexander's reign that the Borgias became suspected of a list of crimes, including murder by arsenic poisoning. The Borgias would utilize arsenic to amass wealth and power. Alexander would appoint bishops and cardinals who were encouraged to fill their pockets with the prerequisites pre gained by the church. After doing so, they would be invited to dinner where the Borgias would ensure their guests consumed all of their wine, which had been spiked with the nefarious poison. The victim would eventually die and then, according to church law, all of their property would, would revert to their executioners. The Borgias continued until they, they were amongst the wealthiest and most powerful people in Italy. Their power was only compounded with Alexander's daughters, Lucretia's three marriages, which each brought further wealth and power, as well as Alexander's son, Caesar's position as capital general of the papal army. Eventually, the Borgias would face justice when they became victims of their own murderous plot. One night, Pope Alexander and Caesar were expecting to en entertain a group of cardinals. They returned early, and prior to the cardinals' arrival, they requested that a servant bring them a bottle of wine. 
Whether the action was intentional or an accident is unknown, but the servant wound up bringing them a bottle laced with, you guessed it, arsenic. The Pope died, but Caesar managed to survive. Following an old superstition for treating poison, Caesar had slaughtered a mule and wrapped himself with the carcass. The superstition maintained that entering the body of an animal warded off the effects of poison, and surprisingly, somehow, it must have worked because Caesar did in fact survive although he would never again see the power or wealth his family had systematically stolen. Looking retrospectively, many believe that Lucretia was innocent of her family's crimes, but unfortunately, her name has been irrevocably tarnished and tied to these horrible acts. Arsenic's role in politics can also be seen in the fact that some have gone on to speculate that Napoleon Bonaparte may have been poisoned by arsenic-infused wine served to him while in exile. Whether this theory is true or not is irrelevant, because its mere existence proves how big a presence arsenic poison had. While arsenic may have been used by political elite, it is not exclusive to them. It was a poison that did not discriminate. It was available to all social classes. The ease associated with obtaining arsenic led to its popular use, which in turn led to its gaining the nickname Powdre de Succession, or Inheritance Powder. The dastardly element gained the name because it was popularly used when individuals got tired of waiting for their inheritance. Rather than letting nature take its course, they would decide to nudge nature along with arsenic. It truly is depressing to think that someone would resort to killing a loved one simply because they got greedy and wanted immediate access to their inheritance, but the list of examples is quite long. One such example is the 1833 murder of George Bodle. George was 79 and owned a prosperous farm in London. One morning, he woke up and came down to the kitchen where his maid had prepared coffee. After he drank the coffee, the grounds were reboiled and three women in the house also had coffee. Then Mary, the charwoman, an old term for a house cleaner, arrived and took the grounds home with her. There she made some more coffee from the grounds for her and her seven children. However, after brewing the drink, Mary's eldest daughter noticed the coffee looked odd, so they refrained from drinking it. Within minutes, however, everyone within the house who drank the coffee fell ill. Eventually, everyone recovered, except for George, who died three days later. The motive for George's murder was quite obvious. He was a complete jerk. George's son, Middle John, worked for his father as an ordinary laborer and was treated as such. Middle John's son, Young John, also worked for George until George fired him. While the two Johns both had motive to get rid of George, they were not the only ones. George's son-in-law, Samuel Baxter, had just witnessed a new will for George that greatly favored Baxter. So all these men had ample motive to get rid of George. The two Johns would have gotten rid of him out of hate and disdain, whereas Baxter could have gotten rid of him simply because of greed. While inheritance was often a motive for arsenic poisoning, it was not the only one. Another motive for arsenic poisoning was for unhappy wives to get out of their unhappy marriages. In the mid-century, arsenic poisoning was commonly the resort of women who mostly targeted their husbands. These women were in a perfect position to poison their husbands because since women at the time were expected to cook and prepare their husbands' meals, they were perfectly positioned to spike their food with small doses over a long period. One such woman was Marie Lafarge who we have already discussed. Marie Lafarge is the most popular arsenic poisoning story of 19th century Europe. Marie was an aristocrat and orphan who was forced into marriage by her family when she was 24. Her husband, Charles, had posed as a wealthy manufacturer and owner of a chateau, when in reality he was bankrupt and the chateau was a dump infested with rats. Marie hated her husband and it was only a few months into the marriage when he presented symptoms and soon died. Charles's family was suspicious, and Marie was charged with his murder. Marie was not the first, nor would she be the last homicidal wife. One of the most infamous poisoners was Giella Tofana, an Italian professional poisoner. She was known for selling arsenic lace cosmetics and instructing women on in how to use it. Not much is known about her background, but it is believed that she spent a lot of time with apothecaries and was present when they made their potions. She was able to learn a lot, which would prove helpful when she developed her own poison, aquatofana, 
although it is also possible that her mother invented the poison and Tufana merely inherited the recipe. Tufana was sympathetic to the low status of women and often sold her products to women trapped in terrible marriages. He was considered a friend to troubled wives and received many referrals as a result. Tufana was eventually caught when a customer made her business known to papal authorities, but she was so beloved in the community that they protected her. She saw sanctuary in a church, but when a rumor spread that she had poisoned the water, the police stormed the church and apprehended her. Under torture, she confessed to killing 600 men with her poisons in Rome between 1622 and 1651, but that number cannot be confirmed. She was executed in Rome along with three helpers and her daughter, Girolama Spera, who participated in the business as well. At the same time, another professional poisoner, Hironyama Barra, was also active. Barra was a fortune teller who met Tofana and learned some of her secrets. The two worked together until they started drawing attention. Tofana went to Naples while Spara made her way to Rome. It was here Spara formed a secret organization that helped women plot and carry out the murders of their husbands. Spara was exposed that the several women divulged their crimes in confessional. The papacy learned of the organization and that they met nightly at Spara's home. She was arrested along with some accomplices, most notably Gratiosa. Spara's principal poisoner. Unlike Tofana, Spara refused to confess under torture, but this not, did not prevent her execution. Murderous wives were such an issue that in 1851, the House of Lords tried to pass a law forbidding women to buy arsenic. While all of these stories may have happened long ago, that does not mean arsenic poison is long gone. In 1904, Julius Arthur Newland first synthesized leucite. During World War I, America developed it as a secret chemical weapon. It was given the codename G34, which was previously used to refer to mustard gas. This was intended to keep leucite's production a secret. However, leucite was never actually used during the war. After the war, America had produced 20,000 tons of leucite, using it primarily as an antifreeze for mustard gas. It was soon replaced by a mustard gas variant and declared obsolete in the 50s. Stockpiles of leucite were neutralized with bleach and dumped into the Gulf of Mexico, although some stockpiles were ma maintained. Later on, an event entitled the Chemicals Weapons Convention would see to the ban of production or stockpiling of leucite. When the ban took effect in 1997, there were 6,747 tons stock stockpiled globally. As of 2015, 98% have been destroyed. Arsenic poisoning was so popular that through much of the 19th century, a third of all criminal po poisonings involved arsenic. One reason for its popularity was simply its availability. One could simply go down to the local chemist shop and say that they needed to kill rats. They could then purchase half an ounce of arsenic for the low, low price of a two pence, which is the equivalent of two pennies. Besides being able to purchase it, arsenic was readily available because it was so abundant in homes during the Victorian period. Homes at the time were highly toxic because arsenic could be found in numerous things like wallpaper and paint to facial cosmetics. Many paints contained pigments based on arsenic compounds, the most popular being emerald green. Additionally, some women would apply a mixture of vinegar, chalk, and arsenic topically to whiten their skin. This was intended to prevent aging and wrinkles, but it inadvertently led to some amounts of arsenic being absorbed into the bloodstream. Another reason for its popularity was that it was undetectable. For a long time, there was no scientific methods of detection, and since its symptoms often resembled other illnesses, it was easily misdiagnosed. While there are some examples of modern arsenic poisoning cases, they are few and far between. Arsenic has mainly fallen out of favor as the poison of choice because advancements in technology no longer make arsenic poison as undetectable as it once was. It is no longer as easy to get away with murder by arsenic. Additionally, changes in divorce law have also made it easier for women to get out of unhappy marriages, thus removing the need for them to kill to get away. Arsenic has such an interesting and checkered history. I truly had a fun time learning about it and hearing all of the crazy stories.
It truly is surprising to learn that at one point, arsenic was such a prevalent problem. One could be poisoned at any moment and not even know it, and there'd be nothing anyone could do to stop it or prevent it or treat it. Luckily, with the passage of time, that is no longer the case. We no longer have to fear that every meal we eat has been secretly poisoned. Fear of murder is no longer hanging above the he our heads. Arsenic went from being one of the world's most greatest poisons to now one of its most obsolete, and I hope things stay that way.